Hello, welcome to the Auto Rob course. Um, this is for uh, for students at the University of Michigan. This is uh, ECS 367 and uh, an introduction to autonomous robotics and robotics 511 robot operating systems for fall semester 2020. Um, I am Professor Chad Jenkins. I'm going to give a lecture on path planning, which we're going to use for uh, for the first project in the course. Um, and so I'm just just so so everybody knows, uh, I'm recording from my my home. This is my my small home studio where I'm where I'm uh, where I'm recording. Uh, you know, you might hear noises and things in the background. That's my kids. They're waking up. Uh, this is sort of early in the morning, and so uh, so. But hopefully, uh, you'll you'll get a good lecture, and you'll be ready for the first project uh, wherever you do this in the world. Given that we have people working all over the place, and so we're gonna we're gonna do our best to to help you have a good experience and give you a good pathway into the field of robotics because we need lots of great people uh, in our field to help help the the advancement that we need to move forward. So with that, we're gonna get to it, um, and then I'm gonna put myself. Uh, on the screen here, so we can, uh, so you can see me. So, so uh, give me one second. I'm gonna turn, gonna put myself on here. Here, here I am. Uh, so usually I'm not gonna, you know. So we have slides online, so you can follow along on the slides online if you'd like. Um, I'm not gonna block this, this all the time. I'm just gonna pop up every, every, every now and then. Uh, but for the most part, I'll be down here. Um, and, uh, and if you, and everything that, that you need for the course is going to be available at the course website that's right behind me. This is autorob.org. And so, uh, so feel, please feel free to, to follow along. But with that, um, the first thing I want to, I'd like to talk about is that, um, just to motivate why, why we, we care about path planning, but also why we care about robotics as a field is that, uh, is that it's really, it's more, it's not just about the technology, about the people. Um, it's about the people you get to work with and help, uh, and help, uh, and, uh, advance our community. Um, and I've been fortunate to have great mentors. So if you've seen one of the previous lectures about what is a robot, you got to see my, my doctoral, uh, my doc, my PhD advisor, Maya Matarik, talk about, uh, and I, we talked about rehabilitation robotics. Uh, but I've also had all sorts of other great mentors uh, throughout my career. Um, one of those is uh, Professor Manuela Veloso. And so, uh, so, uh, so uh, Manuela, um, Professor Veloso was, uh, was, at, was at Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and I've been all over the world with Manuela. We, I, think we, I think I've been on three different continents with her and we've gone around and seen all sorts of robotic stuff and, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and really started, started to have some, some interesting adventures together. Um, but wherever we go, she is bombarded with people who want to ask her questions and talk with her and, and, uh, and just, uh, and just be able to, to, to get the chance to, um, just discuss things with her. And the reason she is so popular, uh, so much more popular than I am is because she helped start the, um, the RoboCup foundation, which is, uh, which, you know, brings together things two things that people really are fascinated by robotics and soccer. Um, and so, uh, and, and so they have these, these robots that go around and just, uh, and just play these fabulous games. And so this was back from, uh, from 2006. That's the YouTube link right there. Uh, they had these robots that go around and their job is to, um, to, uh, you know, in teams of uh, four, I believe, uh, you know, um, pass these, the, this little, golf ball style thing around and then then just basically kick it into a, into a goal and so these things move super fast I mean they are they are they are blurs on the on the field um, but it's just amazing to see how fast these robots move the ability their ability to deliberate and plan and work together as a team to uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of scoring these goals and so it has fascinated uh, many people across the world. Um, and so this is just a, this is just some examples of this. Um, these these systems uh, actually, you know, there's a lot that goes into them in terms of the coordination and how 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 the um, the robots decide to position themselves, the strategy, um, but also the plan the path planning for them to get from to to the d locations uh, that are that are that are needed for them to be, so that they can they can have a, a winning um, well, they can perform in a, in a winning way as a team. And so just to give some examples of this, I took uh, I took an example from. Uh, from uh, from one of the their one of their teams. This is CM Dragons from 2015, and just it's showing it's going through and breaking down step by step everything that they're that they're doing in order to coordinate all of the all of the players 
and put them in a position to score these goals. Um, and what and what's needed with this is that you can plan all the strategy you want, but if you can't get to the to those locations and get there quickly, uh, this may not this may be for for not. Um, these robots move so fast that you actually have to speed them down. And most robot videos, what we have is that um, oops, got to use the right right hand. Um, in most robot videos, this this is not. 0.5 speed. This is slowing the video down. Uh, in this case, they are speeding there. I mean, most times we speed it up. You know, you see videos that are that and essentially ones that you'll see in this class. Uh, we speed it up by two times or four times or 20 times or 50 times just so you can get an idea of how these robots work, even though it takes a long time. These robots are so fast, we have to slow it down so you can understand what what's happening. And so you can watch just step by step what they're doing. And, and even if they make a mistake, they, you know, like the robot may not, uh, may, may miss the ball or, um, or, or, um, or, or, you know, or, uh, or, or something happens that's unexpected. These robots recover quickly can, can, uh, can strategize and replan and, uh, and score and score goals. And so this is, I think this is just amazing to watch. Uh, I'm glad to be able to know people like at, such as my good colleagues at Carnegie Mellon who, uh, who work on these types of systems. Um, and one thing that I think is really interesting is that just like, uh, like real soccer, um, you know, you have, a, you have, uh, you have lots of people that like the, like the, like to do a little bit of embellishment there. But the purpose of this is really to try to field a, a, te a team of uh, robot soccer players that could uh, that can compete with, and I believe uh, beat the FIFA World World Cup champion by the world by the year 2050. And so this is something that you could work on if you uh, if you're if you're if you um, if in your pathway as in your career as a roboticist. Um, but I think the the this is just a start. One of the, the project that I really am am fascinated by the even more so than robot soccer from uh, Professor Veloso's group uh, is the Cobot project. And so the Co Cobot project built from RoboCup. It's the same omnidirectional base that they use, uh, omnidirectional drive system that they use for the. Um, for the robot soccer team, they also use it to uh, to have robots move around their around their space. At uh, this is, I, I believe, I believe the Gates Building at Carnegie Mellon. Um, uh, and so the robots uh, the robots can move around. Uh, they can do all sorts of things. They give tours to people. They run small errands. Uh, they do all sorts of things that that. Um, that uh, you know that you might want to have out of uh, out of a, a partner or a collaborator, uh, you know, just somebody to run errands for you in a in a human environment. Um, these types of systems are, uh, are just like in the robot soccer case. They have to slow them down. These systems, from what I hear, can move really fast, uh, but you slow them down so so they can actually work with people. Um, and one thing that I think that it's really interesting is that this this has traversed over a thousand kilometers around around Carnegie Mellon. So you can see just maps of the building. So I, I took this from uh, from their from their um, their 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 web page, the project web page. And so you can see the the you know all the areas that they've traversed, along with you know the, sort of a heat map of how well how much they've traversed that area, and just it's sort of kicked up over uh, over a number of years. And so this is a really cool project. Um, more importantly than that, for what we need for this class is that uh, is that it starts to get to some of the things that we need to, to be able to make path planning work for robotics. So what you're seeing uh, is uh, is is localization happening. So this they have a Connect uh, RGBD camera. So that's the point cloud you're seeing on the side, and they're using that uh, to figure out where the robot is. Um, given a map of the environment, so they have a floor map of the, of the of the building, and so they can see where the robot is and make guesses about where the robot 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 is in terms of localizing it, and then plan a path. Given that they know a map of the world, and that really is what we're going to do. What we're building up to in this project. Um, I was fortunate enough to see it, see this myself. So this is, this is me. I visited Professor Veloso in 2013. Uh, and you know, she had the robot come greet me. Uh, I love how nonchalantly this, uh, you know, people just are like, Oh, that's a robot. No problem. <laughs> I've been there, done that. I think that's where we want to go. And, and uh, Professor Veloso here is telling me how, uh, how the robot's smart enough and, and won't run into people and, and uh, has, has a, has a smart sort of strategy for avoiding collisions. And so this is really cool to see. I love when you get robot, real robot demos working uh, in real time, I, I just love that. And so, so this is an amazing project to see, and I'd love to see more projects like it. 
Um, but getting to what what we want to do, we're going to take we're going to take a similar sort of approach, but we're going to do it only we're going to start only in sort of a small two dimensional simulated world. Um, the goal of the first project in this course is to develop an A star path, path planning algorithm for for just this two two D environment. All the projects in this class, as, we, as we've discussed, are implemented in JavaScript and HTML5. So you're going to get a, a stencil code uh, that you can use to, to where we have the map and we have the locations and all the parameters. And you're going to implement the A star in front in, in this. Uh, we're going to implement a, just a very simple heap data structure uh, for your A star priority queue, and we'll get to what that means. Um, in addition, we have um, we have the the uh, the the um, the graduate uh, the graduate students will also implement depth first search and breadth first search in a very similar uh, in, a, in a very and and uh, and breadth and breadth first search also in this in a similar sort of template structure and you'll submit your code through your through a get repository which we'll use for for grading. Um, so moving on, um, but really what path planning is about is you know if we had to summer summarize it as into uh, into a um, into uh, in, into uh, into its essence as a problem is that your robot is going to know where it is, it's going to know where it wants to go as a as a location. It's going to have a map so it knows where it's going to run what, at what location it's going to run into something. And what we want to produce out of that is a path that gives us a route that will be collision free from where we are now to where we want to go. And so at this point, this is usually where I where uh, where we bring the robot over. Uh, so if we're in, if we're actually in session, uh, we'll bring the robot over and we'll do an in person in person demo where you, where we have our our fetch mobile robot. We take it around and map in the environment. Usually this is the ECS building uh, in uh, on, on University of Michigan's cam Michigan's campus. Um, this is Jen. Jen was my my uh, my TA back in 2017. This is us bringing the robot over. We map everything out. Uh, we have the robot navigate just so you can see what it looks like in real time. Um, but un unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, you know this is this is going to be uh, this is gonna be we're not going to be able to do that. And so in quarantine, you know that quarantine will get simulation in in, the, in this case. So I'll show. Uh, so one of my students, uh, Alfonso's. Um, he created a, a, a nice, uh, a, a nice um, simulation environment. So, or he's using a nice simulation environment to just show show this off. And so, what you're seeing on uh, it, it was a, it's sort of a kitchen area, and then what you're and then what you're seeing on the left is is what the robot uh, robot sees from its perspective. And so, when the robot starts off, it has a what's called a laser range finding device on it, which Tell roughly the polygon of open area that's in front of the that's in front of the robot, and so that's what you're seeing right there. Uh, that sort of uh, that sort of gray area or light gray area in front of the robot, and as the robot moves around. It can uh, it can uh, it can take that laser range finding can, uh, those laser range finding reasoning and stitch them together to build uh, to build a map of its environment. And so, uh, and so this, these, these routines essentially allow us to build sort of like, you know, it's almost like reconstructing the, the floor plan of uh, the architectural floor plan uh, without needing the, the architect to tell you this. Um, and so once you build up this map, then you can say, uh, then you have something like your own sort of Google Maps. Uh, you can tell the robot, uh, I would like you to go here. So in this case, the robot is, is sort of in the middle of the environment. And then there's an arrow in the user interface that you could say, I want you to go to this location and be oriented in this direction. And then the robot can essentially move in that, move to that location autonomously using something like some form of path planning, usually a star, to go to, to meet the, the location that's, um, that's given by, by the arrow. Um, and you know, and so, and so this is this is essentially what the basic capability that we have of uh, of most robots. Um, so, uh, so. I, I think as a roboticist, I think I never trust simulation. So I should show you at least something real. Um, so um, so if, when we're asking this question of how we get from A to B, which is really what the path planning question is, uh, you should ask, have, can, we, can we see at least a real example of this? Um, and so, so sure, here's, here's an example of us going, uh, going from, uh, from A to B, uh, let's say from, from the blue, blue pen to the green pen. Um, and so uh, this was back when I was at Brown University. We had a robot that was called a Willow Garage PR2 robot. Uh, we mapped out the first floor of the environment, and then uh, and then we then the robot was in the lobby of the building, and we said, "All right, uh, plan a path to from the lobby back to our back to our lab." 
and the robot was uh, was able to do that. So this is the robot. This is a uh, this is sped up for X in our case. Uh, so it just planned a path, um, and then it just followed that path back. Um, and this, you know, and this is this is a this is just sort of a standard thing that we're able to do with the, with the robot. This was shortly after we unboxed our robot. This is when we got it, just to make sure that it was working. It was like one of the first tests that we ran. Um, and so that really is what what we're going to try, what we're going to do for this this uh, this assignment. Um, I find that it's it's easiest to sort of discuss a star, sort of going back to, to to robot soccer as an example. And so I've been doing this for for a number of years. So back when I was at Brown, uh, we took and we didn't have like the nice omnidirectional robots. We we um instead used the uh, used the uh, um we would we would uh, we'd have uh, we'd have little Roombas that would that would go around and and they would push the balls and and kick them towards the goal and they would actually use a big volleyball. Um, back in those days we had, uh, because, um, because we wanted to do this as cheaply as possible, we would take a computer and put them on top of, uh, on top of a Roomba. Actually, we didn't use the Roomba. We used the iRobot Create. Um, the Create was, was like a Roomba, but, um, but didn't have a vacuum on it. So we would consider it a Roomba that didn't suck. Um, ha ha ha. Um, but, um. But we would put sub, we would put computers on top of them, give them cameras. We also had an overhead camera system that would look down for AR tags as well as the ball to be able basically give us an idea of where other robots are um, with an identifier, but also where where obstacles were. And usually we treated the AR tags as as obstacles. And so uh, and so using this, we would then uh, we would then have the robot. We would be able to study navigation, but also have the students play robot soccer, which was, you know, in sort of a one on one or two on two setting, uh, which was which was quite useful. And so this is just an example of seeing seeing the overhead system. And then what we would get on the display is uh, is is basically the location. So you can see that in the lower uh, lower right hand corner, you would get you would basically get the field. And you see the field, and you would see where all the other all the other tags are, and the tags would either be labeled as a, as another robot or an obstacle. And then the robot would just be able to try to get the the ball there. So if you think of the ball as our goal location, um, we would try to say how do we get from our current location to a lo to a, to the robot pose that's next to the ball. And so if we we've sort of pushed this out a little bit, the way we think about path planning is if we want to go from our current start location to a goal location, we will break the world up into uh, into a uniformly distributed array of of, uh, of cells um, that form into a into what we call a graph structure, um, and for, between the cells of uh, inside of this graph, uh, we're going to consider there, there to be edges. So edges connect uh, connect cells that are next to each other, and we and allow for us to transition from one cell to the next. And we might weight the cost or the the distance from one cell to the next by by um, by some value uh, that we can we can choose. Um, we also note that certain cells are going to be in collision. So there might be some collision that exists in the world. And so we want to make sure we don't run into, into, into any objects. So some of those will be just considered invalidated as, as collision areas. And our job for the path planner is to figure out how do we find a valid, a valid path, uh, a route through these cells to get from our start location to our goal location. And so this is there are a number of approaches that we're taking. Really, what I'm talking about is a is a graph search approach. Um, and so what that's going to be the the point of of this lecture. But we'll also talk about other approaches that don't make these assumptions, such as bug algorithms. Uh, we'll talk about uh, ways that you can you can do roadmap based planning based off of sampling. Um, and so that's uh, that's that's using rapidly exploring random trees. And there's also uh, optimization methods that use uh, that use oftentimes some form of local search, like a gradient ascent algorithm. But this lecture really is about the graph search-based approach. And so let's consider, and when we're thinking about how to do graph search, let's assume our, 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 our navigation problem is set up as a graph. Let's consider just a simple, like we, this, this will work for any graph structure, but let's consider just a, a simple graph to, to just get things started. Um, so um, here we go. So consider that each uh, each robot. So let's consider that every possible robot pose uh, is a is a node in a graph. And so we're going to have a start pose, a goal pose. Uh, we'll have um, we'll have uh, well, you know, each of these circles right here represents uh, represents a, a pose that the robot could be in, or a position, or a location that the robot robot could be in. Um, 
so graph edges will connect together uh, each of these poses and make make and we're going to consider consider an edge uh, to to be to to, to uh, indicate that we can reliably uh, reliably move between these two between these two poses without a collision occurring. Or we we have uh, we have reliable methods that can do that. Um, edges have a cost for traversal in general, so we could, so it's basically you know how much the, how much cost would you incur going from one node to to the next. And then uh, each node maintains uh, the the distance, or more, I, I say distance, but really what, what we say is the cost of going from, of how do you get to that node through a route back to the start. And so that's gonna, so each node is gonna, is gonna maintain that distance or that cost. Um, and then every node also has a parent. Uh, and so that parent gives you, is, is essentially routing information that says, from this node where I'm at right now, if I wanna get back to the start, I'm gonna to go to my parent next. And then that node will have a parent, and you'll go back to that parent and you'll traverse all the way back to the, you can traverse all the way back to the start. And so what we're storing at every node is the cost, the current cost of that node, plus the cost of going from the node to that, to that parent. And that is how we know, uh, we know the, we can maintain this distance. Um, and so what we want to figure out for our graph search, the things we want to infer is what's the, how do we optimize uh, these routes so that we can, um, so that we can minim so we can, um, so we can um, minimize the distance to get back from the, that we can minimize the, the distance from where we are in this node to back to the start. And then which parent should we be using for every node? And so what we're going to do is use a single template to represent the, a, a collection of graph search algorithms that we can use for, use for this purpose. Um, with where some are going to be better than others, but we'll we'll but we'll have sort of a, a larger view of this. So let's first start by thinking about uh, one of the one of the simpler algorithms for doing this, which is uh, a depth first search algorithm. So we're going to start off with just sort of the walk through and intuition of what this uh, what this what, what this method looks like. So if we if we start off, we're going to have our have our goal and our start locations, and so. Uh, so this is our, so you can't see that right now, I'll move over to the side. Um, so this is our, this is our start location down in the, in the lower right and the goal location in the, in the upper, in the upper left. Um, and so we're going to express the, the start pose of the robot, the start and goal pose as a, as, as a, as 2D vectors in the world coordinates of the field. So they're going to be, these are going to be continuous values. They're going to, you're going to have an X and Y uh, location that represents the start and an X and Y location that represents the, the, um, the goal. And we consider these configurations. We usually we use the, the, the variable Q to represent the configuration of the robot. Um, and then we're going to assume that 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 our space, our our 2D array of of square cells, are going to is going to be a sort of a discrete dis a discretization of our of our of our workspace, our our space here. And we're going to assume that each of these cells can is uh, that this 2D array is indexed into uh, it has indices i j, which talks about the row and column of the of the uh, of the, within the within the the grid the cell grid uh, that. And then each each cell is going to is going to have a 2D center location expressed in the world coordinates of the field, and then have epsilon length sides. And so it's going to be a these are these are these are going to represent an area of space. Um, and so in that case, what you should consider is is that what if our robot pose that we're given as a start or a goal doesn't happen to actually sit on one of the on one of the centers of the cell? And so you should just remember that. Um, that what happens is, can you give me one second? Um, no, I'm recording something right now. If you want to, you can go upstairs with Wesley. Thank you. Uh, the problem with me recording lectures at home is I have to compete with Pokemon. Um, and, um, but, uh, and so, so hopefully, uh, hopefully my daughter won't be too upset with me. Um, anyway, the graph node. So when we consider a particular configuration of, uh, of, of, of the robot, we're going to have to figure out whether that configuration sits within, within a particular cell. And so we should note that, you know, that our configuration queue for a particular robot, we have to test it to make sure it fits within inside of the extents of, of one of these, uh, one of these graph cells, uh, and, um, one of these grid cells. And then, uh, and we should do that for both the start and the goal. So we know where we're going to enter into the graph. 
uh, for our start and where we're going to depart, where we're going to exit the graph when we know our graph, when, when we know our, our search has ended. And so when we, once we do that, once we figure out where we're going to, to access the graph and where we're going to depart from the graph, those now, now become our, our start node and our goal node. Um, and then we can begin our, our, our search tra traversal. Um, when we do this, the start node uh, that we that we that we're accessing the graph into uh, is 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 visited first, and so we're going to visit a collection of these nodes and build up our search as we visit each of these nodes. Um, because the start node is uh, is at the location where we are starting, it's assigned zero distance, and it is its own parent. It is going to be the root of our of our uh, of our route. Once we do this, we're going to add neighbors, the neighbors of, uh, of, the, of the start node into what we call a visit list. Um, and so, so all the, so the three cells that are adjacent. We're gonna also note um, the order at which these cells are, are added. So in this case, we're gonna start with, uh, with um, east, then south, there's no node to the south of us, then west, and then north. And so we're gonna, so we've added a number that says which, uh, what, you know, what is their, what, in what order have they been, been placed onto the visit list? So for each of these neighbors, we're going to, um, we're going to, uh, we're going to ask if the, um, if the current node that's being visited is, becomes the parent of this neighbor, will that, um, will that lead to a shorter distance back to the start? Um, will it make a, will it make for a better path essentially? And if so, then we're going to assign this, uh, the name, we're going to assign, uh, the visited node to be the neighbor, to be the parent of this neighbor node. And then additionally, we're going to add, we're going to, um, we're going to change its value, uh, the, the distance value for, to, um, to update the distance value that we're in a matter that reflects this node, uh, this the visit currently visited node being the, being the new parent. Um, and so in this case, you know, none of these nodes have been assigned a value yet. So they're going from infinity to, uh, to a value of epsilon. In this case, we're considering epsilon to be, to be a value of one. Um, so then we're going, so for depth for search, we're going to then uh, visit a, a, a new neighbor um, based off of the, by for the order that they are, they're added, they were added to the visit list. So in this case for depth for search, we're going to, we're going to add, we're going to, we're going to visit the most recently added, uh, element, which is going to be the one to the North with the value of three in our, um, in our visit list. And we're going to mark this node as visited. So essentially we're going to remove it from the visited vi visit list. And now we are visiting it. And so we're going to repeat the same process that we've done before. We're going to add the neighbors of this currently visited node to uh, to the visit list, um, noting the order that they were added. And then we're going to decide, you know, should this new node be the be the new parent? Does it provide a better route back to the start? And if so, we're going to update the the distance at the at um, at uh, that's stored at each of these at, at each of these node locations. And then we can do this again. So we'll we'll repeat. Find the the most recently visited uh, recently visited node or uh, recently uh, no, recent most recent node added to the visit list. Um, we'll then uh, we'll then add its uh, add its neighbors onto onto the um, onto the the visit list, updating their parent relationships and their value and their um, and their their distance values. If a node is in collision, we would not add it to the visit list. So that, that's one that we don't want to consider. So in this case, we realize this one's in collision. So we're going to take that, that one away. If we continue these iterations, uh, we'll, we'll see that we can, that we'll, we'll, um, we'll keep going on. We do not, just noting that we don't add neighbors if they're in collision or if they've already been added, uh, already been visited or, or, que or queued onto our, our visit list. And then, um, and we'll, we'll continue these iterations. So, and I'm just showing sort of iteration by iteration what's happening. Um, and we're going to continue to go until we reach our, uh, until we reach our, our visit, our, our goal, our goal node. So in this case, when we're, um, when we're in, in this case, our, our goal node has just been at, is now appears on our visit list and will be visited next. And, um, and then we found that goal node once it's, once it's visited. And so we find a path that looks like this. And that is how we, how we do, uh, how we, how we do it in, in this case. And so we're fortunate that, uh, that this, this maps out to a pretty reasonable path, 
Um, and so depth first search, you know, is great for finding a, a valid path. Um, and so, uh, and, but we're going to see maybe there's some downsides to depth first search. Uh, so that's the basic idea of the, of the search process that we're, that we're going to use. So let's turn this idea into, into code. And that means that uh, that our search algorithm is gonna, you know, this is just a, a template. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through each individual element. I'm gonna leave that for you to, to think about. But I'm gonna go over some of the highlights of what this uh, what this will look like. Um, and when we start off and we initialize, each node has a. We just note that each node has a distance and a parent, um, and that we're going to um, and we're gonna choose. We're gonna start our our visit list to be the the start node uh, that we that we that we're accessing the graph. Um, all other nodes are going to have are going to be considered unvisited and have a high distance that that should be so far away from from anything reasonable that uh, that it represents sort of infinity in this case. Um, then in our main loop, what we're going to do is we're going to visit every node uh, and compute the and, and compute its distance and parent. Um, and so what we're really asking again in this case is, is we're going to um, we're going to select the node to to visit. Uh, based off of the priority. So in depth first search, it was the most recently added to the visit list. Um, when we're gonna we're gonna pull it off the we're gonna pull that the element off the visit list and then uh, and then visit it. And then within that that iteration, what we're gonna ask we're gonna we're going to um, we're gonna add the un uh, the unvisited neighbors to the unvisited uncued neighbors uh, to the visit list. And then we're just going to ask this question again: If this current node is becomes the parent, uh, does it create a shorter route? And if so, it becomes the parent, and we update the we update the route information and the the distance to the start. Uh, we we update that that information, and so that's what we're saying right here. And once we do this for all the nodes until our queue is emptied, our visit queue is emptied, or we reach the goal location, uh, we're going to continue this process, and then uh, and then at the end we're going to out we're going to output the the routing information as the the parent and distance of all and, and distance to, to start for all of our for all of our nodes, and that really is our is our is our search template. So let's come back to depth first search. And look at it with respect to the with respect to this template. So in this case, what we're going to say is is that our our um, that we're going to pull from our the essence of this is that we're going to pull from our our visit list the highest priority element and visit that one next. And so for depth first search, that highest priority the priority is based off of most recently added. And so we were going to have uh, so this really equates to being uh, our our visit um, our visit list is really a, a stack data structure. Um, and so we're going to pop the most recent element off the top of the stack. Um, the stack data structure is uh, is is a if for for those of you who have taken data structures, this is I should be telling you things you already know. But if you haven't, uh, because we are because robotics is a multidisciplinary field, um, the stack is really the is really a, a last in first out uh, structure. So what you do is you push elements onto the stack. So in this case, we're pushing elements. We start off with an element of one. We push a two on, a three on, a four on, five on, six on, and we build up this stack structure. And then we can only take elements out by popping them off the top of the stack. So we're going to then take the, the most recently out. So that means we will always take the most recently added element off of off the stack. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so this is just an example of this. So, so, uh, so really we have a last in first out uh, visit list. If we run uh, depth first search, we get something that looks like this. Um, I'm gonna put my, I'm gonna put my glasses on uh, for this. Um, so, so these are my, these are my nerd glasses. I love, I am total nerd. Um, I'm just owning it. Uh, and so, uh, and so, so here we go. Um, but, but I'm also in my 40s, so I need, I need glasses to see stuff. Um, and so this is what what it look what depth first search looks like. Um, it's usually it's usually great, but uh, but I think you know, but I like to to show things running in uh, in real time. So, um, and so in my browser, I've already written code to uh, to to show depth first search working. And so if I uh, so I'm going to restart this. And so so what you're seeing in blue is our is our start node, and then uh, and then over in, in green uh, in the lower right hand corner is uh, 
is the goal node. And so depth first search is really just sort of, it's going and, and sort of following along these rows. It's really, if you're note, it's, it's always adding the, the most recently element, a uh, recently added, uh, added location. And so it's just sort of going around and, and doing all sorts of stuff. Um, would not, you know, in, in a, in a manner that, that, you know, that is kind of arbitrary based off of the order that we've chosen to, uh, to, to add elements onto, to this list. So, so we really get sort of, uh, sort of arbitrary behavior. And then when we actually get to the, to the goal node, um, we get sort of a, sort of a, a big winding, uh, winding path back to the, back to, to the goal node, um, and so that really is, you know, so we will find a valid path, but it may not be, uh, it may not be the, the best path. And so, um, and so, you know, so I think that's, um, you know, it depth first search is a good, good way for us to, to start the discussion, but maybe isn't the, isn't the best, the best choice in the end. So let's go back to keynote. All right, and so this leads to other options that we could use. Uh, so one of those options is breadth first search. Um, so breadth first search will take will use the same uh, the same template that we've had before, but instead of uh, considering the the highest priority for visiting neighbors as the most recent, it will consider the priority as the least recent. So we're going to consider the last element that was the the the, the most uh, the the um, the uh, the the element that was added uh, furthest back in, in in our in our history, um, and what this equates to is really using a queue data structure. Um, so a queue is going to be a first out, uh, first in, first out data structure. So we add elements onto the back of the queue, but then we pull elements off of the front. And so what that means is that we're always taking the the element that um, that uh, that was that was added uh, that was added first. Um, and so uh, and so this uh, so with this type of data structure, we get a we get paths that sort of look like this, which looks a little bit cleaner. Um, I'm going to put the glasses back on so we can see what this looks like in action. Um, and so here we go. Go back to Firefox. And so that was depth first search. And so if we run our JavaScript template again, I'm going to start it over just so you can see it. Um, what we're going to do with breadth first search now is, is what we can see is that, that what happens is that we, that as the search is running, it's always looking at the frontier that's around the, that, that's at the, at the edge of the, of the, of the search of the, of the visited elements. So that means that we're net, we're all, we're always sort of insured of, 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 of visiting neighbors that are going to be, uh, that are be, that are equ they're equal distance away from the, uh, from the, uh, from the start. You know, and so we're, we're always sort of doing this. This breadth first search is always going to maintain an equidistant frontier in our in our search process. Um, and one good thing that results from that is that we know that the that um, that on this frontier, as we as we add these elements on, that we're always have that that always represents the shortest path back to the goal. And so what we're going to get in this case is we're going to get uh, is that once the once the breadth first search reaches the goal location we know that we can we can get the we'll have the shortest path because that is what is on the sort of the, the edge of this uh, breadth first search frontier and so we're gonna i'm gonna let that finish so you can see it this is so suspenseful um and there we go and so now we find uh now we find a a, a good path back to the back from the goal to the, from the start to the goal. And so breath first search works, works pretty well. Um, but there's also other choices that might be a little bit better. So, so for instance, we can consider Dijkstra's, uh, a, the Dijkstra shortest path algorithm. Um, when we use Dijkstra's, um, that's still going to consider the same search template, but now we're going to consider priority, not based off of when some, when a, a node was added or when, when a node was added to, uh, to our visit list, but actually based off of some, some more informed, uh, priority. Um, and so in this case, we're going to make, we're going to make priority be, be, be related to the minimum route distance, uh, to the, back to the, to, back to the start. So as we add, so we're going to consider every, every node to be, um, to, uh, we're going to consider its, its distance back to the start as its priority. Um, 
And so really what Dijkstra's algorithm is doing is allowing us to, to say what, uh, you know, pick our priority based off of, off of this, this distance. And so I just want to do a quick walkthrough of what this, what this will look like. Um, I'm going to pop up for doing this. And so I'm going to turn the key off. And so here, here I am. So when we're doing the we're doing we're doing this walkthrough, we're going to start off and we're going to have the the current node uh, be zero, and we're going to look at the neighbors. And so when we're looking at the neighbors that we've now put onto the visit list, uh, we're going to say that um, that we're going to look at the at the at the value that's offered back, the distance that's offered through this through this parent. Uh, and so in this case, for the two neighbors. It has a, they have choices of for the for the one at the top uh, keeping its value of infinity, which is really isn't that good, or adding on the value of the parent plus the um, plus the the edge distance, the dis the line distance that travel the edge distance that traveled from that node back to its parent, which is five, and so clearly five is a better choice. Um, additionally, if we have uh, if, if the for the node on the bottom, the neighbor on the bottom, it has a choice between infinity and uh, and um, and 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 eight, and so we're gonna. So from that, we can add those back on, and we'll choose uh, the node with the least, uh, with the lowest uh, distance, which is going to be the, the node which has five. And so once we do that, that node now becomes our current node, and then we're going to look at its neighbors. And so when we look at its neighbors, we, if we look at the one at the top, that neighbor hasn't been hasn't been queued yet, so it has a choice between infinity or uh, or the value of the parent, which is five plus one, which is the edge cost. And so we're gonna choose that, that will become a six. Uh, the one in the middle, it chooses between infinity and 11, which is the value of five, the distance at the parent plus the edge cost. And then at the one at the bottom, we're gonna see that now we have a choice between uh, the neighbor at the bottom, we have a choice between eight, which was a direct route to the parent, or we could choose between between five plus two, which is which is going to that this node that had five, um, plus an edge distance of, of two, which is going to be, which is going to actually offer a better route um, than the sort of immediate connection. And so we're going to update that value to be seven to route through the to route through the current node. And so when we update that, that's what this that's what this will then look like. Um, and th so now we're gonna now we now we 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 uh, we visit the 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 um, the element of the visit queue that has the least that has the lowest distance, and so that will be the six up top. Then we're going to look at its neighbors, and then we're going to update their values. So we have a choice between 11 uh, and uh, and 6 plus 3, which is going to give a better route for that for that middle element uh, through the current node. And then the the um, the node at the goal hasn't been visited yet. So um, so now we can now we can we can just update that value directly, and so that gives us a, that gives us a new update. And now we're now we go to our our our, our next highest priority element. Which is going to be um, which is going to be uh, seven, and then we're gonna we're going to um, we're going to update those values. Uh, so so now we'll we'll note in this case that the that the current if we use seven of the current pair that won't provide a better route uh, because that will that will give me a, a route distance of of ten. But we already have a better route through the through the node at the top, which has a value of six, which offers a a distance of nine back to the start. Um, and so we'll keep that one, and then we'll we'll reassign the the value to the one at the bottom. Um, the the node that the next node that we that we visit offers no new better route, so we're gonna we're gonna ignore that one. Um, and then um, and similarly, the node of the goal doesn't offer a better a better route, um, so we're gonna we're gonna ignore that one too. At that point, uh, we we have really an empty queue when we come to uh, to our to our uh, visited node when we come to this node that's visited, and then our search our search ends. And so at this case, what we have now are routing information. We have route distances and parents uh, for every uh, for every node, and we can and that provides us a a search tree. And so with that. I'll go back to the corner and, uh, and we'll continue. And so one question I would just ask you to think about is, uh, is what will Dijkstra's algorithm look like in, in this case? What, what, what do you think Dijkstra's algorithm will produce in terms of search algorithm? I'm going to go get my coffee while you think about that. Just take a... Take a small sip. Here we go. Great. 
Um, so what'd you come up with? What'd you think about? Well, uh, the reality is, is that uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, it will produce something, uh, it will produce actually something looks something very, very similar to breath first search. Um, so if we actually compared, uh, paired breath first search with, um, with, uh, with, um, with Dijkstra's, um, you'll notice that the, that the, that the visitor pattern looks, looks very similar. The route that we produce may not, may not be the same, but it's going to be, it's going to produce an, uh, it produces an equal length, uh, equal length path. And, uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, and has a very search pattern because we can see that frontier. And so I would just ask you to think about why does this visitor pattern look very similar? And so that's just going to be something for you to, to think about. Um, and so this brings us to, to a star shortest path. Um, you know, the question now is we, we have a, a way to get to the, to get the shortest path, but, um, but do we have, um, but, but maybe we could make it a little bit more efficient because there could be a lot of things that we have to search over. Um, and so in this case, what we're going to do with a star shortest path is now we're going to, we're going to consider priority in a, in a different way. Instead of the minimum distance, just back to the start, we're also going to sort of optimistically think about, uh, about, um, uh, think about the distance, uh, an optimistic distance to the, to the goal node as well. And so what we're going to do is use our priority. That's going to, that's going to be, that's going to be what we call an F score, which is going to be the sum of the distance that we've been storing along the, the from along the current path back to the start. And we're going to add to that the best possible distance to the goal, and that best possible distance is going to give us um, is going to give us uh, uh, a heuristic that's going to help us maybe inform our search to to um, to perform uh, to 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 take less time and visit fewer nodes, um, and that's that that's sort of the, the hope. And so uh, and so that is why. So if you're asking yourself why A star is advantageous. It's hopefully going to be. It's going to. It's going to make our search more more efficient. Um, and so this is the same search that we had before, uh, except that what you'll notice is that that we're we're actually going to. We don't have this big sort of triangle shape that we that we have when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at 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 at, uh, at the exploration. We actually visit view, visit fewer nodes. And so I'm going to go back. So now if we go to our browser and we look at this, we run around the A star algorithm. So I'm going to go and just restart this so you can see what it looks like. So when we're looking at how A star is behaving uh, in the in the in the search procedure, what it's doing is it's it's informing its search to go to be biased towards the goal location, and so that's why you're seeing more of the more of the the visit, more of the the exploration happening towards the towards the towards the goal, and some of it still going behind the behind the uh, the um behind the start, the, the start node, because you never know if you're, if you're going to get trapped and you need to backtrack. Um, and so there's going to be, you know, so there, so, so the search is, you know, is, is guided towards the goal, but not restricted to just go towards the goal location. And so as a star moves along, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's continuing this, uh, this, this informed search towards the goal and, and actually we'll, we'll finish, uh, finish pretty soon. And there we go. So that's a star search. All right. Now going back to the presentation. Um, so when we look at a star search compared to uh, compared to to Dijkstra's or, or breath first search, um, really what you're seeing is 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 fewer nodes that are that are that need to be that need to be used in order to they need to be visited in order to complete the search, along with finding the along with uh, with guarantees on finding the, the search the the shortest the shortest path. Um, and so, how is this possible? How can a star visit fewer nodes but still find a full, still find a shortest path? And really, it comes down to a star using an admissible heuristic. The F score that we're using for a star is an admissible heuristic to uh, to estimate the cost uh, to the goal from a, from any particular node. And so, when we're thinking about what this heuristic looks like, uh, this straight line uh, H score essentially is we'll say from any given node X, we're going to consider that we have the path back. Uh, G, and then we're going to add to that the straight line distance H, um, and that's going to always be less than. It's going to be admissible because it will always be less than or equal to the true cost to the goal. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so, uh, so that true, so so this so this admissible heuristic always gives us a a, a a lower bound on the on the possible cost to the goal. 
And we also assume that this, uh, that this heuristic function is consistent and that it obeys things like the triangle inequality with respect to, uh, with respect to other, other nodes that are in our graph, other locations in our space. Our two-dimensional workspace will be, will be a metric space, and so it will remain consistent. And so I'm just showing some examples. So you know, way back when we did robot soccer, uh, in the in you know using the using the uh, the Roombas and, and the iRobot creates, um, this is just showing the that given the overhead system that we have, that the robot would be able to use the A star algorithm to to move around the goal. Um, you can see some of the the downsides of of just using uh, of just using straight A star gridded with, with with this, and that it sort of is moving chunk by chunk. To every, between every grid cell, um, one thing that also that also you have to be worried about is that uh, that even though you have the, the the overhead localization, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can use that, that knowing that that you still need a servoing strategy, you still need a control strategy to get you from one location to the next. And so we'll talk about PID control a little bit later. In this case, they were they were relying on the odometry that comes off of the wheel, so the based off the wheel spin, know, knowing how well. The, how the robot moved. That may not have been the best choice uh, in retrospect, but they got something working, so that was that was pretty cool. Um, one thing that you should note is that we can also avoid dead ends. So, um, so if we were just to go straight and go straight towards the towards the ball, going straight towards the the goal. Uh, or trying to trying to go get the ball, uh, we would we would end up in this rut in this sort of what we call local minima that would get us stuck, and so we'd always have to backtrack. Um, the A star algorithm will will understand that that's uh, will in, in its planning will will know that that's not the that's not the right thing to do, and will um will pop will will avoid that uh, that that dead end, and then be able to go to go straight to the find a good path straight to the ball. And so in this case, you're going to watch the watch it watch it go watch it chunk between all of these uh, all of these grid cells um, because it's just sort of uh, because what's happening with the A star in this case is that it's uh, it's it's still you know we we could do some we should do some path smoothing in in this case and and usually what we should know is that you usually don't take the path that comes right off the planner you do something to make it to make it nicer to make it more amenable to to robot execution um, but we did not do that in, in this case um, so let's assume that and let's consider the case where we uh, where our H score or F score for our priority is actually equal to our H score. So why not? Let's just try it. Let's just be optimistic and consider that we can we can just go straight to the goal. Maybe that's a that's that's a good thing that we could try. Um, and so what what would this be considered is it would be considered a greedy best first search. And so if we did that, uh, we could actually produce. Uh, so we're gonna we're just gonna ignore the the distance along the path back to the start. And we're just gonna consider our f score to be the best possible distance to the to the goal. And if we do that, we can actually, in certain cases, we can get really great performance. So uh, in this case, we had a, we had a direct path from the uh, you know we visited very few nodes and we got a we got a, an optimal path from the start to the goal. Um, that and and if we compare that to what a star looks like you know we got this you know this was amazing you know wow best first did great um but that may not always apply so if we so let's, let's say we did something we we changed the we changed our um we changed our environment a little bit um you know in this case what you know greedy best first is going straight to the to the is going very close to the to the goal which is in the lower left hand corner and and so it's looking good it's looking good but then it gets trapped and then so it, so it spends most of its time backtracking most of its time backtracking to find a to find a valid path and in the end we end up with something that that wasn't uh that wasn't um that that's not an optimal path it's not the shortest path whereas a star you know, tried and true, you know, comes back and still gives us a good shortest path. And so, you know, so, you know, so there's a reason why, why a star works pretty well. And is sort of the workhorse that we go to for, um, for, uh, for many of our, our path planning, which of our path planning. And so one thing that we should note is in order for this to work, we have to have a notion of a, of a priority queue, um, that allows us to, to, to extract the, the highest priority element. Um, we could always just sort of do a linear search all throughout our, our all through our um, all through our, our visit list, but that's going to be very inefficient as definitely as as our space grows. So we want to be able to have a fast way of doing this, and so a heap data structure actually is is quite good for this. Um, 
So in the heap data structure, what we're going to do is we're going to consider our, our priority queue to be a, a what we call a min binary heap as, as one example for a priority queue. And so this is what we'll, what we'll do in this class. Uh, a binary heap is essentially a data structure that, uh, that satisfies the heaping property. And the heaping property is such that, that the parent in, a, in, in, in this tree can, can, only, can have up to two children. And whatever those children are, they, those children have to be a lower priority. So you can have a max heap where the, where the parent always has to have a greater value than its children. Similarly, you can have a min, a min heap where the parent always has to have a lower value than its children. And that's the only really property that we have to have. And, and you know, so, you, so, a parent, so a node can have zero, one, or two children for a binary heap, um, and, the, and, um, and the parent has to have a higher priority. And that really is the, what we have for this data structure. Um, we can store a heap as an array. And so we just have to note that the heap element, that at a particular heap element, that we can find its children. Uh, if we take that, if, it, if that heap element has an array index of i, uh, we can find the, the child of that array, the, the children of that array location at, at, at array indices 2i plus 1 and 2 times i plus 2. And so those will be the children. And the parent will be at, uh, if we take i minus 1 divided by 2 and then the floor of that number, the parent will of, the, of, that, of this current node i will be at that index. And so we, we can note that heap as, as, this, this, as this array structure. Um, and so this is just an example of the of the heap array structure. I'm just uh, illustrating this for you to for you to look at and uh, and just keep in mind. Um, and so there's a, a couple important uh, important uh, operations that we should note for the heap. Uh, one is how do we insert a new a, a new element into the heap? Um, what we'll do is we'll with is we'll and we'll take a this is a this is going to be um, in this case a, a max heap. Uh, so for, for this for this case, we have a new element 15 that we want to insert onto, onto this heap. Uh, when we do that, what we're going to first do is we're going to take that new element and put it into the last element of the, of the tree, which in, in the case, if we store it as an array, will be the last element of the array. And so we'll just, we'll just put it onto there. Um, once we put the element there, we're going to then try to, try to, 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 um, to, uh, to reassert the heap condition by swapping the parent by swapping this element with its parent. Um, and so if so in this case, we'll note that, that eight has a lower priority than node 15. And so what we're going to do is then swap, uh, swap those elements. And then we're gonna continue to do those swappings with, with the parent, with this element and its parent until the heap condition is satisfied. So in this case, um, in this case uh, we're, going to, we're gonna swap until 15 becomes the, the node with, fifth, with the value 15 becomes at the, becomes at the top of the heap. Um, so that's great. So we can insert elements onto the heap. What about when we want to extract elements from the heap? And so once we have, in order to extract an element from the heap, uh, the extraction actually is quite, quite easy. Whatever the element is at the top of the heap is our highest priority element. We just take that off and, uh, and that becomes our, um, and that element then becomes our, uh, becomes what we use to then, to then visit in the A star search. Uh, but that leaves us with a hole at the top of the heap that we have to then that we have to then fill. Um, and so what we're going to do with that is we're going to take the last element off the off of the uh, off of the um, off the heap and then place it onto the root. So we're taking the end of the element at the end of the array, putting it onto the onto the front of the array. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to swap. The, we're going to take that element. That's at the top of the heap, and we're going to swap it with uh, with its highest with its higher priority child, and we're going to continue to do that swapping down the heap until our heap property is now satisfied, and we now have a valid heap again. And so that's what our extraction is going to look like. Um, and so there's a number of things that you should you can you should consider as we're as we're as you're implementing your your a star search and your um and your your heap is how many operations are needed for a heap insertion and extraction, um you know you know 
uh, how much better is a min heap than an array with respect to the number of operations? And so you just can consider that. Um, you know, how do you deal with duplicates? How should you measure distance? In our case, I will always assume that distance is is Euclidean distance um, because I because I think that is the most general representation for all, across all of our search rep search algorithms. But um, but what you find if you have a grid structure for two D path plane that Manhattan distance may perform uh, oftentimes performs better. Um, but that is only in, in that special case. And so, um, and so you, sh you can consider all sorts of different types of metrics and, and their admissibility. Um, and so this is really the basis of what you need to get started with the, the path planning algorithm, um, uh, you know, from an algorithmic perspective, a computational perspective, but we still need to turn this idea into code. So, uh, so what we're gonna cover next in the next lecture is I'll talk about uh, JavaScript and HTML5 and how we get this working with our search canvas. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and so I love JavaScript and HTML5 as a, as an idea, and I'll talk a little bit more about why I love it, um, and, uh, and how we can get things working in our browser. All right. Thank you.